Okay, everyone, we are going to start. Hello and welcome. Vitayu Siech. My name is Gillian Tett. I'm with the Financial Times newspaper in New York. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the final closing debate of this conference, which is looking at the question, is the liberal international order over? Is the liberal international order over? I should say the question for this debate is not should the liberal international be order, order be over, but is the international order over? And it's an issue of great interest to the Financial Times because as some of you may have seen, early this year, we had an interview with the Russian president where he declared in the pages of the Financial Times that the global liberal international order was or is indeed over. Now, we should define what we mean by the international order, and I'm going by definition from Foreign Affairs in June 2011, which says this. The liberal international order is, quote, open and rule-based international order enshrined in institutions such as the United Nations and norms such as multilateralism. So, is it over or not? We have two absolutely fantastic people to debate this topic. On my left, your right, is Neil Ferguson, the professor of history who's written many best-selling books. I think some of you have actually got them with you right now, who has been writing a series of pieces over the last few years on this very topic. And he is going to be arguing in favor of the international order being over. You essentially agree with the Russian president on stage, I think. I Not thought you were going to be an unbiased moderator, Gillian. <laughs> no, I'm being normative. And on my right, your left, is Fareed Zakaria, again, a prolific writer a great intellect, and of course, a very famous face on CNN each week where he talks about global international affairs. And he is going to be arguing against the motion, I should say, taking the position the Financial Times has taken, and I'm looking forward to a very interesting debate. I'm standing here between them. I'm neutral. I'm going to be moderating, and I will be hopefully sparking some interesting conversation. Now. Those of you who've not been to a debate before, let me say, it goes like this. In about 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you all to vote with the machines that you can see on your seat. If you agree with the motion that the global liberal international order is, ob is over, not that it should be over, but that it is over, you press green. Yes, duck. If you don't agree with that, you think that the liberal international order is still around, you vote red. So we're going to do a vote in a minute. While you're thinking, I'm going to explain what happens then. After that, Neil is going to speak in favor of the motion for five minutes. Fareed will vote speak against it. Neil will then have a chance to disagree with Fareed. Fareed can then have a chance to disagree with Neil. I will then ask them both questions, and then finally we'll have summary positions, and then comes a really interesting fun part, which we get to find out whether either of them have changed your minds at all. Do you think that you are susceptible to being influenced by either of these great, warring, competing intellects? And the best thing of all is that I am standing up and for almost the only time in my life, I get a chance to look down on both of them and keep them in their places. So let's start with the vote. All of you take your devices and vote on the question, is the liberal international order over? Not should it be, but is it over? If you agree, press green. If you disagree, press red. And this is called suspense. 
also a great test of Ukrainian technology. Okay, so Neil, you have your work cut out. 50% of people dis disagree that the global international order is over. They think that we are still working according to the international rules-based system with multilateralism and the United Nations. So, you have exactly five minutes to tell us why you think that is wrong. Well, thank you, Gillian. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me no pleasure whatsoever to agree, I think, for the first time in my life with Vladimir Putin. I am not here to tell you that it should be over or to say that it's being over is a good thing. We're merely being asked, is it over? Now, as it happens, Farid and I have debated this once before. We debated it on April the 28th, 2017 in Toronto, Canada, a pretty liberal, international and orderly place, and he won. Let's just ask ourselves, what's happened since then? Well, has the liberal international order got any better with respect to trade? Bad news, average American tariff rates have gone up since then from 3% to 21% by a factor of seven. How about the international order with respect to migration? Walls are being built all over the world since we debated even the Danes have restored their national frontier. And in the poll that was carried out for this conference, 80% of Ukrainians disagreed with the proposition that immigrants strengthen our country. For Germans, the proportion was 66%. How are the institutions that were supposed to uphold the liberal international order doing? Well, the World Trade Organization is, I think it's fair to say, paralyzed. The Paris Climate Accord is working so well that global emissions have risen significantly since we debated Farid. In the case of the Asia Pacific region, they're actually up 5%, only the European Union of all the regions in the world has reduced emissions. The International Monetary Fund, that guardian of international capital markets, has pulled off another of its uh, recurrent triumphs in Argentina, uh, the latest country to impose capital controls and default on its external debt. We won't intrude on in the private grief of the European Union as the internal divorce known as Brexit continues towards its denouement. Oh, and since we debated Farid, I think the INF Treaty died and the Iran nuclear deal is pretty much dead, to say nothing of what uh, remains of the United Nations and the Budapest Memorandum guarantees of Ukrainian sovereignty. So it doesn't look to me as if the liberal international order is thriving. It's markedly deteriorated, Farid, since you won that debate. I suppose, and I noticed that the timer has died on us, Gillian, so I'll give myself a minute and then shut up. You have, uh, yeah, two and a half minutes, I think. You have two the, and a half minutes. The question you have to ask yourself is whether or not there ever was a liberal international order. It's a little bit like what Voltaire said about the Holy Roman Empire. It was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And I'm not convinced that when we look back on the history of the last half century, how liberal or international or orderly the order really was. In truth, the most important institutions that maintained peace and prosperity were none of the institutions that I have referred to. The most important institutions were US-led military alliances of which NATO was by far the most important. And the good news is that that institution, despite the great pessimism that surrounded it at the time of Donald Trump's election, is still alive and kicking. But for me, that's not the liberal international order that Farid and others write about. More like a conservative national order. And it's that order that I think Ukraine should pin its hopes on
much more than on the crumbling institutions of the allegedly liberal international order whose demise we are, I fear, sadly witnessing. Well, thank you, Neil. Um, essentially, your argument is, Professor Ferguson, that last time we debated against each other, I lost. Since then, everything's got much worse, and so now I should win. Is that essentially what you're saying? And by the way, if I don't quite like the question, I'm going to change it. I thought you were going to be an impartial moderator. <laughs> no, I'm setting for read up for what Another I think. Another win. <laughs> it's rigged, people. <laughs> for potentially quite a difficult job, because as Neil says, on almost every count, the pillars of the international order appear to be crumbling. So, is it over? Tell us why it's not. Um, thank you so much, Julian. You are certainly the most distinguished moderator we've, we've had. Um, I will point out that my task is more difficult, actually, than you realize, because a majority of you agree with the proposition. Now, Julian didn't explain one thing. We, we win the debate not based on how many of us, or, or how many of you agreed with us, but how many we are able to move in the second vote. So in other words, I now have to get an even larger majority to agree with me, which is going to be very difficult. So I take that challenge seriously, and I'm up against one of the world's best debaters. The thing I have going for me is I happen to be right and he's wrong. <laughs> so let me explain why. And I, I say this with some trepidation to a great historian. For most of human history, there has been war, there has been famine, there has been disease, there has been autocracy. Uh, and the, the, the truth of the matter is, history sort of worked in cycles. It moved backwards and forwards in ways that it was very difficult to tell that there was much progress. Um, and then after 1945, something extraordinary happens. You begin to see a market shift, particularly along the dimensions that Neil and I study, uh, war and peace and the like but also some other things. And you begin to see an extraordinary rise in peacefulness, stability, international cooperation, international engagement, trade, and the like. There had been a movement up before World War I, but it then, uh, of course, collapsed. But since 1945, you have seen an extraordinary reality in Europe, which for 500 years had countries that were killing each other at extraordinary paces. Remember, the, the uh, Hundred Years' War killed a third of the German population. Um, found itself in a situation of peace, prosperity, stability, and ever-deepening cooperation. Some things as, uh, uh, as simple as taking another country by force, taking territory by force after 1945 has declined to the point that the annexation of Crimea stands as almost the only exception to this rule in the last 50 years, which is why it has been such a dramatic and drastic move, uh, and which is why Russia faces sanctions from almost uh, the entire Western world as a consequence of it. If you look at war, if you look at violence within states, if you look at almost every, any definition of human rights, you see an extraordinary line that has moved up since 1945, for 75 years. And so do you say, say to yourself, how did this happen? This, this really does seem extraordinary, and you can call it what you will, but it does seem that some kind of global system of rules, of norms, of values, has been operating, particularly in the advanced industrial world, but increasingly in other parts. And so you say to yourself, it must be that everything was perfect and these institutions like the United Nations worked fantastically and countries like the United States upheld these norms. Well, not exactly. There's a new study out, for example, take something like state sovereignty. The country that violated state sovereignty the most since 1945 by far is the United States, which has 72 times tried to interfere to change a government in the world from 1945 just to 1990. And then there's an additional 21 cases after 1990. I know it looks like we're in a terrible moment with regard to trade, with all this protectionism, but I would remind you, tariffs in the industrialized world are on an average at 4% right now. 
They were at 3% before Trump. They've gone up a bit because of Trump unilaterally raising American tariffs so much. Tariffs in the industrialized world in 1975, presumably the heyday of the liberal international order, were 20%. Uh, if you look at almost any index by which you would ask yourself how much cooperation did we have, we had much less in the, in the good old days. Take migration. Until 1965, the United States had a whites-only migration policy. And by the way, this is all, I'm, I bring up the United States because this is the country that supposedly built the global international order, the liberal international order. And this is the country that was excluding non-white people from its borders, invading countries, uh, trying to change their regimes, and maintaining high tariffs. How do you explain this? Well, the you important have point... nine I'm, seconds. The important point I'm making is simple. The liberal international order wasn't ever that great. It did mark a big change. And the reality is we are still living in that muddled world of a liberal international order, which remains pretty robust despite some deterioration here and there. Right. Well, thank you. Okay, Neil. So Fareed argued that actually... If you take a long-term view, much of that order is still in place. It was never as perfect as people thought, and so it's not quite as imperfect as people worry about now. What do you say to that? Starting now, you have five minutes. You know, there's real history and there's fake history. And the problem with fake history is it's kind Speaking of seductive. Speaking as a history professor. <laughs> it's seductive to tell a story about international institutions producing a, a more harmonious and more peaceful world after 1945, except that that omits all the multiple conflicts that were fought in what used to be called the third world, in Southeast Asia, in Central America, in Southern Africa, right the way through until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The reality is that for most of the period that Farid is talking about, there was no long peace, certainly not in those developing parts of the world. And, and that really seems to me to give the lie to this story of a liberal international order. In truth, until around 1991, the dominant structures of the global order were those of the Cold War. And as Farid himself acknowledged, during the Cold War, the United States, and let's not forget Farid, the Soviet Union, repeatedly violated the sovereignty of other states in pursuit of their geostrategic advantage. So there was nothing really very liberal about it, nor was it terribly international, and it certainly wasn't orderly. The liberal international order proper only begins, I think, with the end of the Cold War and the transition to essentially a unipolar order when the Washington consensus could be made available to more and more countries. And that was a consensus based on American ideas that free trade should prevail, that limits on capital movement should be reduced, and migration, migration also increased. That was the liberal international order. It culminated with the admission of China to the World Trade Organization in 2001. And who benefited from that supposedly liberal international order? I will tell you, China, the last communist regime standing after the 1989 revolutions. And who else benefited? The 1%, or to be exact, the not 0.1% of people in the Western economies. So it's not surprising under the circumstances that there was a backlash against this liberal international order. Fareed was one of those who regularly argued in the 1990s and in the 2000s that China would become more liberal after it was admitted to this wonderful liberal international order. This was the biggest wrong call of American foreign policy since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The reality was that this order benefited China so much that China's gross domestic product actually overtook that of the United States on a purchasing power parity adjusted basis in 2014. And only belatedly, maybe too late, 
did the United States wake up and realize, I can't tell what that means. Does it mean okay. I have you three minutes or two minutes left? It means you've got two, one and a half minutes left. Plenty time to win this. <laughs> it meant that a backlash began, not only in the, in the United States, but in a great many other countries, and not only in European countries, not just in the UK, but as far afield as the Philippines and in Brazil, because people saw that the liberal international order was a scam, a scam which benefited the least liberal of the great powers, and a scam that benefited only the elites in the developed countries. So it doesn't seem to me that you need to, to agree with Vladimir Putin in voting for this resolution. You simply have to agree with reality. It is regrettable that this a crisis of the liberal international order appears to have benefited him, but I don't believe that he is the true winner. In fact, I'm going to leave you with the possibility that the crisis that is coming to the authoritarian states in the next 10 years will be as satisfying, if not more satisfying, than the populist crisis that has swept the Western world in the last two to three years. So when you vote, as you should, for me and for this motion, you are not voting for Vladimir Putin, because he too will fall victim to the backlash against the oligarchs, which is a central part of the rejection of the fake liberal international order. Thank you very much. Vote the right way next time. Well, I think you've just seen a bit of masterful jujitsu in terms of debating style and trying to twist the question back on itself. But first I want to hear from Fareed because you have been, or rather your network has been accused a lot in the last year of peddling fake news. You're now accused by Neil Ferguson of peddling fake history. I don't know which, which hurts more. So, but you now have five minutes to tell us why Neil is completely wrong. So Neil is absolutely right. There, are, there is history and there, there is fake history. <laughs> there are facts and there is, are fake facts. And so the question of whether or not there has actually been a decline in, in war, in interstate violence since 1945, is actually a much researched topic. The most famous researcher on this subject in the world happens to be in the front row, Steven Pinker. And so I, having not spent the years that Steven Pinker spent, uh, who was, by the way, a faculty colleague, was a faculty colleague of Neil's, uh, co compiling the data, have the advantage, thanks to modern technology, of being able to, while Neil was talking, simply Google the chart that, that he has very famously produced. I, you can't see it here, but it's very simple, and it shows a massive market decline in interstate violence since 1945. So you can have your anecdotes about the third world. If you actually count battlefield deaths, by the way, if you count non-battlefield deaths as well, the line is very clear. It goes down like this. There is a reason, I suppose, on a point Neil... of information, uh, <laughs> Madam no, Chair. No, 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 Neil, you a can't point of information. No, no, Neil, you can't this is a thing. You, will have, no. you okay. will have your turn. You will have your turn. You have your turn. There is okay, so... a reason I think Neil left the departments of history at uh, Harvard and Stanford <laughs> and went to the Hoover Institution, uh, an institution devoted more to opinion, shall we say, than fact. You're allowed so, to argue with each other <laughs> and interrupt in two minutes, okay? You get 20 seconds back for read. No, but I have to finish my five minutes, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're huh? gonna, so you now get All 20 right. seconds more. So now I just have to make, how much time do I have left? You, you have four minutes. All right. So I want to talk about the central charge that I think Neil Ferguson made about the collapse of the liberal international order, which is the rise of China. And he is right that lots of people said that China would change as a result of its integration uh, with the West. Um, and, when, and they said it, and people now say, oh my God, they were completely wrong because they promised us that China was going to become a Jeffersonian democracy uh, as a result of all this. I can't speak for other people. I never said that. I did say China would change. So let me ask you, what you whether you would define this as change. When Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon went to China in 1973, 
Mao's China was the leading rogue state in the world. It was fomenting, arming, and funding revolutions against liberal democracies and bourgeois governments all over the world, from Latin America to Africa to India. And there was a point at which Mao was, spending, was, was funding 15,000 mercenaries in Africa alone. Pol Pot and Mao used to meet to discuss how best to destroy the global liberal international order. That was the China of then, completely cut out from the world trading system, completely cut out from the world economic system, and actively seeking to subvert it. China today is the second largest funder of the United Nations in the world. It is the largest funder of UN peacekeeping in the world. It sends more peacekeepers around the world than the other four permanent members of the Security Council put together. It is the second largest funder of most UN agencies in the world and the largest funder of several of them. So you said, oh, that's fine. That's just buying respectability through the United Nations. But of course, China is actively undermining the world trading system because of its rapacious capitalism, uh, because of its mercantilism and anti-liberal behavior. Maybe, but I would direct your attention to the period of the early 1990s when people made every claim, and I mean every claim that they make about China now, about Japan. Every single claim that was made about China is, was made about Japan, but now people say Japan is a great upholder of this liberal international order, and China is, uh, is, is an opponent. Look, the truth is, China has a large market, and countries with large markets often bend the rules to their advantage, often not breaking them, but really bending them. The best exemplar of this, of this uh, practice, and the businessmen in the audience will know this, of course, is the United States of America. Credit Suisse has put together a report that actually tries to tabulate the number of non-tariff barriers that every major country in the world propagated in 2015, over the last 10 years, 2005 to 2015. The number one proponent, uh, implementer of non-tariff barriers in the world was the United States with 450. Number two, by the way, was India. Number three was Brazil. Number four was Russia. China was number five at okay. one third the number of the United States. All right. Okay, your time is up. So, right. thank you. So you both set out your, close, your opening arguments and you rebutted each other. And now, essentially, we have the best bit, which is kind of a free for all, where I get to ask you both questions and you can officially interrupt each other, Neil. So the question I'd like to ask first, though, listening to you both talk, you're both slightly talking past each other because you're talking about different timescales. For you, the liberal international order has started in 1991 or 2001. For you, it started in 1945. Neil, justify why you have such a short liberal international order. Because the dominant structures after 1945 were not, in fact, the United Nations uh, or any of its affiliate institutions. The United Nations was paralyzed uh, by the superpower vetoes on the Security Council. The dominant institutions of the period from 1945 until the dissolution of the Soviet Union were the military alliances of the superpowers. And so we shouldn't kid ourselves, as I'm afraid some academics do, that the liberal international order was born in 1945. That's not what happened. The dominant structures were the Cold War structures, the military alliances of NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And those were the dominant institutions, the superpowers and their proxies and institutions that, that essentially shaped the world. You know, surely one doesn't have to explain that in Ukraine. How liberal was your international order between 1945 and 1991? Huh? I don't know. My impression is that it kind of wasn't that liberal or that international, and the order that you had was the order of the Soviet boot. So it's clear that there isn't an, a global liberal international order until the Soviet Union dissolves, the United States has won, okay. and then you transition to the uh, order that Farid is idealizing, and as I said, the results of that order after the 1990s were far from beneficial. China the last communist regime standing apart from North Korea was the main beneficiary. Okay, so Farid, are you defending something that's actually indefensible? 
So think about uh, the 1930s. The most illiberal countries in the world were in Europe, Germany being the perfect example. France and Germany fought three wars between 1850 and 1950. In the last two, they dragged the rest of the world in. Since 1945, the big shift that took place was in the Western world. There was the creation of a zone of international order, of rules and economic cooperation. It then spread slowly, attracting more and more countries, first in East Asia. Then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it expanded even further and included a larger and larger ambit of people. To deny that is to deny the extraordinary experience of the European Union, which has taken countries that for 500 years have warred against each other and have instead managed to build a rules-based, peaceful international order. People still, to my mind, don't recognize how extraordinary, how ahistorical this is. The idea that the French and the Germans, the, the Brits and the Spaniards would not be going to war with one another when they did so routinely for 500 years uh, is an extraordinary achievement. And to deny it just because you want to win some debating points, Neil, really does a disservice <laughs> to the, the actual history here and the actual uh, extraordinary achievement of a continent that you were born on. And these were ideas, of course, that were nourished and developed in Scotland, the, the, it is the Scottish Enlightenment that transformed Europe in towards this greater sense of economic liberalism, uh, of, of uh, peace and stability among nations. And so the one thing that I always thought all Scots were proud of was this extraordinary heritage of Adam Smith and, and, and Hume and Ricard. And you're, you're just throwing it all away to win, you know, to win a few okay, votes, so Neil, votes in Kiev. Neil, are you betraying your, ha your homeland? So now the liberal international order began in the 1770s. <laughs> One important point that you should not miss is that embedded in Farid's teleology of an ever more peaceful world is a fundamental error about the incidence of conflict. Now, Steve Pinker is a great friend of mine. Uh, we go way back. But he would, I think, admit that that chart that you showed on your, on your phone, Farid, is not an uncontroversial chart. And indeed, a new book has just been published that refutes the claim that there is a clear linear path uh, from conflict to peace, which is Farid's central argument. Actually, when you look at the incidence of conflict, it, it doesn't follow a linear path at all. Uh, if it did, how on earth would you explain that the two biggest conflicts in all of history happen in the middle of the 20th century? It may be that there'll never be a conflict as large as that again. But we can't know because there isn't the linear trend that Farid claims. In reality, tomorrow the theory could be destroyed in a day in the event of a nuclear exchange. Even a limited nuclear war would instantly destroy the claim that we've arrived at perpetual peace as a result of an international order. Finally, it is a little odd for someone who was born in India to make the Eurocentric argument that you are making, Fareed, to insist that what happened in Europe somehow is a substitute uh, or surrogate for what happened in the world. But where was the liberal international order in in, for example, Vietnam? Where was it in Central America? Where was the liberal international order in all the rest of the world, except for the Western Europe, whose story, you insist, is central to that of humanity? But we're not in Western Europe here. We're in Ukraine. Ukraine, which probably, relative to all the rest of the world, suffered more organized lethal violence in the 20th century than any other country. And if you don't believe me, I show it in my book, War of the World. Here <laughs> Neil, of all countries, he, may book. I finish? Here of all countries, surely this is a, a solemn observation. We should not be taken in by fairy stories that the world arrived at perpetual peace thanks to the European Union. Guard yourself against such false narratives and understand the fragility of our world and understand that the reason why there has been less conflict since 1945 is not the IMF 
or the United Nations or the World Trade Organization. No, it has been the fact that the United States achieved military supremacy, unassailable military supremacy that no other great power yet dares challenge. And the danger of Farid's liberal international order, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that it has allowed another great power to acquire the capability for the first time to threaten American military primacy. And that is the tragedy of the fairy story of the liberal international order, that it has served communist China, equipped it, transformed it, not in the way that Farid describes. Do you really think that the most important change in China since 1972 is that China pays for a lot of UN peacekeepers? Do you really think that? The reality is that the biggest change since 1972 is that China is now a superpower with the capacity to impose technological surveillance on its entire population to wage cyber warfare on all other powers, including the United States and no doubt Ukraine, and to acquire the military capability to challenge U.S. primacy in the Asia-Pacific region. That's okay. the big transformation, and it's thanks to the fairy tale of the liberal international order that it's happened. So, Farid. Are you actually upholding a Chinese fairy tale? So Neil said at one point, this is the last thing I will say, and I can confidently declare that that will not prove to be true. <laughs> um, so that was that. There's another fake fact. Um, what is extraordinary in listening to Neil Ferguson, who is, as most of you know, generally regarded as a neo-imperialist, market, you know, libertarian supporter of Margaret Thatcher. He has now come out against a Western-centric view of human history, against the uh, global capitalist order that he claims has, uh, has, has been rapacious towards 99% of the Western world, claims that I tended to think uh, radical Marxists used to make, but not uh, Neil Ferguson, but it tells you how far he will go to, to try to win this debate. So let me tell you what it looked like, the liberal international order looked like to, to an Indian growing up in one of the poorest countries in the world. We looked out at the world and we saw a world that we lived in, which was one without markets, without rules, without uh, a sense of international association. We were shielded behind high tariff barriers, nationalist rhetoric. Uh, and the, the belief that any kind of participation in that world was somehow giving in to a Western capitalist plot. And we noticed that we rather liked the world that the Western capitalists seemed to be building. It seemed to be one of greater and greater prosperity, greater cooperation, a greater observance of human rights, uh, and we desperately wanted to be part of that world. And then when, in 1992-93, the Indian government ran out of money finally, uh, it began reforms that allowed India to join that world, and we jumped in enthusiastically. And as a result of it, not just China, Neil, but hundreds of millions of Indians have moved out of poverty. And 450 million Chinese have moved from living on one dollar a day to living on two or three or four dollars a day. This is the prospect that is frightening Neil Ferguson so greatly. The fact that Chinese peasants, rather than starving, can now feed their children and make sure that they don't die. Um, I think that the reality is that that liberal international order is responsible for more, the upliftment of more human beings in the last 75 years than in, any, than in almost the entire preceding thousands of years of recorded history. You have an extraordinary transformation of ordinary people's lives as a result of it. This came largely from the fact that these countries were able to participate. It would have happened no matter whether, whether or not we had adjusted trade rules one way or the other would not have affected the rise of China or the rise of India once these countries decided to participate in this order. And I think we have to ask ourselves fundamentally, do we believe in capitalism? Do we believe in markets? Do we believe in freedom? And if we believe in those things and the Chinese do well at it, are we really going to say that we would have been better off with a China with a billion peasants living on a dollar a day, with their children starving, than that these people should be allowed to flourish and to live lives in which, of course, 
being different from us and living in different places and having different geostrategic interests, they will, call, they will require a certain amount of management and require a greater degree of cooperation. I, for one, would rather live in a world in which we do not have to prosper by ensuring that the rest of the world is in misery. Right. Well, I'd like to pick up on one thing. Because, Fareed, what you say about the scale of transformation in the last decade or two obviously has deep meaning for the audience sitting here in Ukraine. As someone who did their PhD in Tajikistan in the days of the Soviet Union and has seen friends of mine go from a world where there was absolutely no contact with the outside world and very little chance of ever traveling to a world where suddenly information moves at lightning speed, people travel, there's a sense of being part of a global system. It has been extraordinary. But the question I then have from that is, what about the internet? What has that done to the global international liberal order? Because irrespective of whether you have free movement of goods or people, you have a lot of information and ideas going around the world in spite of censorship, in spite of government controls. How does that play into your vision of whether we have, or whether we are indeed seeing the end of the international order? Can I just ask a point of order? What, uh, do we have closing statements? You do have closing statements. Okay, so so this, is, this is not part This of is not your last chance, no. Your... I mean, I'm still trying to get my head around Narendra Modi as a liberal internationalist. Fareed, is that how you see India's leader? The, the tragedy about democracy, Neil, is sometimes people vote for people you wouldn't vote for. I, I have come to, re to recognize that that is the best solution. Your prime minister in Britain, on the other hand, has decided to simply disobey the laws of parliament. I don't know whether Modi is worse than Boris Johnson, but they are both products of a democracy, and I reluctantly accept that they both govern their countries. The question of why Narendra Modi and Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro and so on are in power is really a question that, that you've raised, Gillian, because it's a little bit like the liberal international order. The internet was supposed to be awesome. Everybody was going to be able to speak truth unto power. We would all have our own blogs and uh, there would be transparency. The authoritarian regimes uh, would fold. And if the Chinese tried to regulate the internet, as Bill Clinton famously said, they would be trying to nail jello to a wall. Fast forward to 2019 and it hasn't worked out that way at all because the internet far from bringing liberal values into power has undermined them at every turn by encouraging not only fake news but extreme views to dominate uh, even in open societies indeed allowing a kind of weaponization uh, of social media to decide the outcomes of elections so i want to suggest to you that the only law of history that really operates here is not some law that liberal international values give you perpetual peace. That's been a fantasy of liberals since the Enlightenment. No, the only law that really operates here is the law of unintended consequences. You think you're going to lead democracy, bring democracy to China by bringing it into the international trading system and all you do is create the most powerful totalitarian regime in history. And you think you're going to bring about democracy in the Middle East and everywhere else by giving people smartphones in the internet and you end up with Trump, and you end up with Boris. And so that's the irony of history, Fareed, that you're missing the grand designs that you had back in the 1990s that I remember reading admiringly in your books have turned to dust because far from a global international order, you've ended up with Chinese preeminence, at least in a half of the world, and an internet that empowers the most illiberal forces in so many democracies. I don't think you can get out of that contradiction in your position. Fareed. I did write a book about democracy in the 1990s uh, in which I predicted the rise of something I called illiberal democracy. Uh, and I talked precisely about the phenomenon we are, we, we are discussing here, which is the rise of populist leaders who come to power 
and then undermine the rule of law, undermine the protections of minority rights, and undermine, in some sense, democracy, democracy itself. I think you would remember it, Neil, because you reviewed it for the New York Times glowingly. <laughs> and so glowingly. I are too I, kindly. I, I, were you... Were you lying then? Are you lying now? Or are you simply a, a, a gentleman does not accuse another gentleman of lying, Fareed. I, I urge you to take that back. I take it back. Well, it's a pity you haven't both brought your books right. with you to throw at each other. But anyway. Let me just make a point about the Internet. Because I hear this all the time. The Internet is now turns out to be the great vehicle of George Orwell's 1984. So I ask you all very simply, you've heard all this. And I'm going to ask you very simply, would you take the internet away from yourselves? Would you be willing to live without email, without text, without the ability to Google at will for every fact, every piece of information, every article, everything, you know, this extraordinary access that we all have gotten so used to that you have all the world's information available to you anywhere, anytime that communication is essentially free, transparent, to no matter whom, you know, anywhere, anytime. This is an absolute revolution that we now regard as sort of like breathing air. You know, try, try living without it. And yes, there are some nasty people on Twitter. And there are some people who put fake uh, Facebook pages on. Oh dear. But I am not willing to give up the entire digital revolution. I'm not willing to give up the extraordinary explosion of knowledge that has taken place as a consequence of that because you have a bunch of people in Macedonia or Montenegro or wherever it is being paid by uh, you know, some Russian bureaucrats to go and, you know, and, and, and do some uh, damage. I have a very simple answer to people who, who, who moan and groan about that. Get off Twitter yourself. I mean, most of these people you know, engage in the nastiest back and forth on Twitter and then you know, get surprised that somebody hurts their feelings. Well, I mean, you were engaged in it. Just get out of it. Just you know, use it as you wish. And so if you are not willing to give it up yourself, Neil Ferguson, don't advocate, don't tell us that it's terrible for the world. It's great for you. Ordinary people benefit even more because it reduces, it does actually reduce barriers to entry in almost every field. It makes people able, and this is one of the disruptions that has taken place. It allows ordinary people to do things that previously credentialed people like us were able to do. Great. It's an enormous democratizing force, but it's messy. Democracy is messy. People make bad choices. We have to be able to live with that. Uh, and that is, yes, part of the liberal international order, that you will elect people uh, every now and then who tend to be a liberal. Neil, are you about to read something from your phone? Well, I'm going to read something from a book, actually, because I'm one of those Does people Does it happen who... to be your book? Actually, it's Fareed's. Oh. <laughs> Let me quote from something you wrote in 1997, Fareed. By dealing, with China, by dealing with China, the United States can encourage it to play by civilized international rules, i.e. stop selling weapons to rogue regimes and moderate its regional ambitions. By increasingly integrating it into the world economy, China will over time become a more liberal state. And then fast forward to your book, The Post-American World. As Chinese standards of living rise, political reform is becoming an increasingly urgent issue. The regime will almost certainly face significant challenges over the next 15 years, even if this does not mean that China will turn into a Western-style liberal democracy overnight, it is much more likely to evolve first into a mixed regime, much like many Western countries in the 19th century, which combines popular participation with some elements of hierarchy and elite control. So I think it's fair to say, Fareed, that your prognostications on the future of China have not quite worked out as you had expected, because we certainly see no sign whatsoever at this point of China moving in those directions, quite the opposite. Okay. Since our debate, and I'll say one more thing, China has Briefly. moved even further away from political liberalization. As anybody knows who, who goes regularly to Beijing, Xi Jinping has tightened his grip on power, has dispensed with term limits, is shutting down what remains of free speech on Chinese campuses, and we're all supposed to celebrate the number of UN peacekeepers that China sends around the world? Do me a bloody favor, mate. Okay, you have 
10 seconds to reply, and then you both have your closing statements. If you want to reply, or you can save it up. I stand by what I said. China uh, in, in, in the in 1970s was actively trying to undermine regimes all over the world. It has not fought a war since 1988. By the way, in that period, the United States has fought about 10. In fact, China has engaged in less military intervention since 1975 than all other UN Permanent Security Council members. It does, in fact, uphold, fund, and, and uh, obey the liberal international order. It has become liberal on many dimensions. And as I said, it is not going to become a Western-style democracy tomorrow. So I, I, okay, right. I feel I like it's, it's, a, it, it's a mixed uh, verdict, and I stand by it. OK, I'm looking down on you both. And I am going to stick to the rules of the game, because that's part of respecting the international order. And I'm going to give Neil three minutes three minutes to up tell us all why we should agree with you that the liberal global international order is over. You don't need to agree with me. You need to agree with Fareed Zakaria writing in December 1996, and I quote, <laughs> many of the rules, regimes, and international institutions created at Bretton Woods in 1944, like the IMF, need overhauling. Others, like the World Bank, may well need to be scrapped. So Fareed's position on the liberal international order has undergone something of an evolution since those distant days, an evolution that I find fascinating, but not as fascinating as the evolution of his thinking on China. You know, I used to think, Fareed, that you work for CNN, but it seems you must have signed a contract with CCTV since I last saw you because more or less everything that you have said this evening has sounded like the Chinese foreign ministry drafted it for you. And I have to say that makes me feel uneasy. And I would have thought that it would make most Indians feel uneasy. And it should certainly make most Ukrainians feel uneasy. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality of our time, which conferences like this I find tend to ignore, is that the Second Cold War has already begun. It is not just a trade war. It is not just a tech war over 5G networks. It is not just an argument about the South China Sea. The United States and China have embarked on a Second Cold War that is already being waged in cyberspace and perhaps also in space itself. Kidding yourself that that is not the case is a common European mistake. In reality, Europe is likely to be one of the battlefields in this new Cold War. And if China has not already come to the Ukraine offering a one belt, one road agreement, then I would think that President Zelensky will get the visit fairly soon from a Beijing delegation, because that is the way that China now plays. Yes, there are a few UN peacekeepers that China pays for, but I would say that the budget for UN peacekeeping is dwarfed by the budget for overseas expansion in the guise of one belt, one road. In this new Cold War, you must be realists and not naive idealists, and recognize that the liberal international order is what brought China to this point, that it can bid for global supremacy, and it may even win. Okay, Fareed, you have three minutes to tell us why Professor Ferguson is completely wrong. <clears throat> Since he quotes me all the time, he can't be completely wrong. Um, <laughs> let me give you the simplest example of the working of the liberal international order. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Poland and Ukraine had the same per capita GDP. Poland was able to join the liberal international order. It was welcomed into it. It was welcomed into the European Union. It was welcomed into NATO. And it was able to find its place in the world in, in that global liberal international order. Ukraine was not, for a variety of reasons. 
Today, Poland's per capita GDP is five times that of Ukraine. That is the liberal international order, and Ukrainians understand it because, as I said, like Indians, they have been deprived for so long the opportunity to participate in it. And so with flaws and all, they understand the opportunity here. Yes, I did want to reform the liberal international order. I still do. And I think there is a great challenge in reforming a, an order to accommodate a rising great power. This has happened throughout history. It is an enormous challenge. But finding a way to allow China to exist within this order without tearing it apart is important. And I bring up the issue of China's support of the UN only to demonstrate that it is not actively seeking to destroy that order, rather to become powerful within it. There is a country trying to, seek, uh, trying to destroy that international order, and that is Russia. Russia is the country that is most opposed to this li liberal international order, most opposes Ukraine's participation in that liberal international order, most seeks to undermine that liberal international order everywhere. If you look at the candidates that the Russians support in European elections, they have varying positions on all kinds of issues, you know, markets and such. They have one position on the European Union. They are all opposed. They have one position on Ukraine. They do not want Ukraine to be part of the European Union. They have one position on NATO. They do not want Ukraine to be part of NATO. That is the principal threat to the liberal international order. Uh, Gillian pointed out that this proposition has already been voted on by one person, Vladimir Putin. Your choice really is whether you want to vote with Putin or with me. And the reason I bring this up is it's important to think to yourself, Tony Blair made this point, do you want to vote with your fears or do you want to vote with your hopes? Do you, you know, people have been claiming that the liberal international order is being destroyed for decades. They've been claiming this thing is going to collapse. But if you vote with your hopes, if you vote with the confidence that it can be sustained, you will help sustain it and make sure Ukraine is part of that future. Well, everyone, you've heard the arguments, you've heard the speeches, you've heard them rebut each other, you've heard them, well, you've heard Professor Ferguson quote from each other's books. Now you have the chance to have your say. This is a moment we've been waiting for when you get your vote. And believe me, it's a lot more fun than the Eurovision Song Contest. So can you all go back to finding your little devices? As I said, if you agree with Neil that the liberal international order is over, you vote green tuck. If you agree that it's, if you think it's not, and you agree with Fareed, you vote knee, red. And I'm sure the suspense is killing us all. It's certainly killing them to work out who's actually won. We're doing, dealing with two towering intellects here. And by the way, I remember that, technically speaking, the winner is the one who moves the votes more. <laughs> well, I have to say that Neil has won on two levels, both in terms of the absolute number of people who agree with him, but also in the number of people who have moved to his side. And I have to confess, I voted strategically. I first voted yes and then voted no to help my own side. It didn't okay. work. That's called election interference. But what I'd like to say more seriously, though, it's been a very thought-provoking discussion. Um, I think I've learned a lot. It's been quite a challenge to keep these two towering male intellects under control. I'm glad I'm taller than them at the moment. But there's actually a very key point I want to end on, which is this. If you do believe in the values of a global international liberal order, having an open debate, having space to disagree, to disagree with each other, 
Having a moment to vote and express your views is actually an incredibly powerful, important privilege. And for that reason, among any others, I should say thank you to both of you and thank you to all of you for having us happen. And lastly, lastly, I'm also instructed to say, by the way, as you go away, you can work out who you want to congratulate, who you actually agree with, whose book you want to buy next. I'm sure they're keen to talk about their books. That we now apparently have a short break and then do please come back after having had a short break because there's going to be a special guest for the closing part of the, today's events. Um, Mr. Pinchot. Thank you, everyone.